everybody, welcome back to the channel and welcome back to the Writer's Bookshelf. So today we're going to do another book by Donald Mass, and this is going to actually be his most recent book. Um, it came out in 2016. It's called The Emotional Craft of Fiction. And this book is probably our most unconventional book so far, um, because so far we've been doing a lot of things on craft, and including um, last season's uh, plotting and, and structure and all of that. Uh, and this season we've been working on character development and settings and plot twists and all of that. And these are all really useful things to know how to do because when we're telling a story we do want to make sure that we put in the conventions that our readers expect you know, and certainly we want those conventions to tell a good story and when we deal with craft you know it takes a lot of practice and just you know a lot of tinkering with ideas and things and it's really easy to kind of get caught up in the weeds of trying to remember like what point i need for this story this story to work and it's all a big mental game and one of the things that we often leave out, um, except for when we use our voice, when we, when we go into the area of voice, we tend to lean into this a bit more, but even still, you know, we are basing it on our attitudes and our perceptions and not necessarily approaching things from a reader-centric point of view. And where this book comes in play um, is you're actually tapping into the emotional core of both you and your reader and ultimately what your story conveys. And this is where things get a little different from what we're used to. Um, Donald Mask comes out and essentially says that he this isn't something he can really teach, which is kind of ironic because there's a whole entire book on the factor of, of writing about emotion. But it's um, it was something that he felt when he was reading all these different stories in a slush pile, why he wasn't being connected. And he thought that there was uh, there was a need to express this idea of, of tapping into three or four. So, if you remember last season, I did a, um, I, I reviewed a book called uh, Story Genius by Lisa Cron. It's actually, as of now, I think my most popular uh, uh, video in this entire series. The only other one I think is uh, Great Stories Don't Tell Themselves. Um, but the Story Genius has definitely picked up some steam. I'm not sure why, but uh, I think it does probably speak to a need that a lot of books don't cover and a lot of uh, novels don't even um, apply and that's the third rail method where you're trying to tap into that core uh, brain area where, where readers really want to connect and resonate and this book attempts to bridge that gap uh, between story and, and connectivity and it does it through these um, chapters with illustrations in the, in the titles um, Get Your Wolf Here which actually my book, one of my bookmarks is very similar to one I was using for this. And so they, um, I know Amazon calls this the illustrative edition, so that's why it's illustrative, it's got these um, chapter headers and things. But what this uh, book really does though, is it gets into this idea of trying to um, express a, a story point that is, it has relevance, has meaning, it, it it's matters to the reader, um, matters to the writer. Uh, one example is the, um, I was just looking at, it was about the, um, yeah. well, I think it's basically, it's about the idea of taking like a, let's say a memoir and, you know, you're mining it for not what actually happened, but why what happened matters, you know? It's um, it's bringing in the, the, the why, you know, uh, the who cares in, in college you know we teach the who cares um in essays the essays is uh when you have the who cares in an essay what you're doing is you're, you're trying to bring the reason for a reader even wanting to read it um it's the same thing here where if you if you lack the ability to connect to your reader's emotions then you're going to lack the ability for the reader to continue wanting to read or, or at least not feeling anything and, and that's where um, one of the last things he says in the book or at least in the last section is if he reads um let's say story a uh it's a plot about a nuclear bomb is you know hidden somewhere in a major metropolitan city and the protagonist must find it and then story b is about a nuclear bomb hitting or being hidden in a major metropolis city and, and the protagonist must find it well there's probably a number of books that have that same exact plot. And his point is he wants to be able to get something different out of each story, even though the plots are the same, even the protagonist 
it'd be the same. The um, it's not a matter of voice because you know the voice will tell a different story. But it's a matter of re matter of reason. So like maybe in one example, um, it, the story is just about that plot. The protagonist, you know, you know, Mr. Mr. Smith must go and you know not only find the bomb but disarm it. Okay, I mean it's it's a nice tense thriller probably, but. If you let's say add a personal stake to the uh, situation, where it's not just you know Mr. Smith having to you know find and dismantle the bomb, um, but maybe this is like his last hurrah. Um, maybe this is like the big score. Um, he spent his entire life as a bomb tech trying to dismantle sticks of dynamite, or um, or maybe he had a lot of duds, and maybe it, he had a relief. But at the end of the day, he wonders, well, like, did my life ever really mount to anything? Because most of what I stopped wasn't even that big, it, you know, or it didn't really, like, it, I, I might have, you know, saved somebody's living room, but, you know, or, you know, might have prevented that one bank heist, but ultimately, you know, what did I really stop? You know, I might have saved, a, you know, a building from collapsing at best, you know, maybe I, I helped an architect, you know, keep his is you know prize joy you know standing another day but when you you know maybe his entire life was that he wanted to have that one big save you know and, and maybe he thought um something to the, the effect of like maybe you know the, the olympic bombing or something that he uh he wanted to stop that and you know and he just never had his opportunity because you know, there just there was nothing really that important um, other than you know just cosmetic things. And I know, like you, know, you deal with like a stick of dynamite, it's not cosmetic; it's still a big deal. But for the sake of argument, you know, he gets this you know call to find this you know thing that can level you know entire um, miles worth of, of infrastructure. Not to mention the you know the human toll. And suddenly his his job matters and it's not just his job that matters today but it's like it i mean he's about to retire so like he gets to retire on his one big moment and so we we tap into you know his psychology we tap into not just the uh stakes of the of the situation but the stakes of his personal worth and you know i mean in comparison maybe it's not that uh important to the reader to um, you know, it might actually trivialize, trivialize the situation, um, but does it really? So there's actually a chapter here on inner versus outer. Uh, that's in the one with the wolf, and you know you have the difference between showing on the outer mode, and you have. Let's go find the inner mode. Can I find it? Probably yes. Inner mode's telling. So showing versus telling. And um, it's kind of showing how you can do that effectively. And then you have something called the other mode. Um, doo -doo -doo. So the outer mode, or the other, sorry, the other mode uh, would be the reader's emotional experience to this. So you have the outer and the inner are based on the character and, and what's happening in the story, but then the outer, or the, sorry, the other mode would be what the reader feels. And this brings us back to the emotional core. Now, if without the emotional core, you can still have a story, and the story may or may not work, but it, it probably won't resonate as well, and certainly won't be that memorable. And that's another point that he makes in the book, is you want your story memorable, and the emotion, the thing that we feel, is what allows it to do that. So let me um, read you the back of the book, just so you can kind of see what a full picture of this book actually is about. So every fiction writing guide offers its own set of beliefs, techniques, and methods for crafting a novel, developing the values a particular structure deems necessary for powerful prose. But while writers might disagree over showing versus telling, or plotting versus pantsing, none would argue this. If you want to write a strong fiction, you must make your readers feel. Some italics. The reader's experience must be an emotional journey that aligns with your character's struggles, discoveries, and triumphs. That's where the emotional craft of fiction comes in. Um, and so some of the things that you learn how to do is create an emotional response in readers by showing and telling. Uh, so it doesn't dismiss talent, as you can probably tell by chapter two. Uh, oftentimes we are taught to, to only show, but maybe that's not really the whole story. Because even um, when it comes to summary, you need to tell. Because um, sometimes tell is your shortcut to the situation. 
uh, in order to get your reader there quicker. Um, but also, you can use telling to kind of captivate a more general idea so your reader is more familiar. Whereas showing, of course, plays out the scene. But showing by itself, again, without context, doesn't mean much. And I think that's the point there. Uh, develop a moving narration style that allows the audience to enter a character's head. Um, so that would be, I think, the point of view. Like, is that the deep point of view? Um, well, we'll get into the, the chapters in a minute here. Um, weaving the character's inner journey with the plot points of the outer journey. Uh, that's something that we learn a lot too with, in things like the story grid and um, the, um, I think uh, Robert McKee's story talks about that and of course um, Writer's Journey, uh, Christopher Bogler teaches that. Um, so you understand readers' expectations for a character and why they fall in love with certain protagonists. So I think that's the heart of the message here. Um, there's a page I'm going to read uh, that I thought that actually kind of redefined my whole outlook on storytelling. Uh, I think it's very important here. Home in on specific elements of fiction that deeply affect readers, such as forgiveness, sacrifice, and betrayal. That's something that they kind of cover near the end of the book. Um, there's an entire section on what makes the characters re not just redemptive, but um, identifiable. Um, so it gives the, the story its heart. Um, so the final thing here is readers can simply read a novel or they can experience it. If you want to give your readers an experience start by conjuring vivid, authentic emotion on the page. And that's really what this whole book is about. And it even gives you these little things called the emotional mastery uh, techniques here. And it gives you a checklist of things you can do to enhance your emotional or your readers emotional response. So like in, emo in number eight, you know, it's called the meaning of everything. Uh, he suggests that you choose any small thing that happens somewhere in the middle of your manuscript. When you find it, write down your answers to the following questions. This small event is symbolic, but symbolic of what? What does it mean to your POV character personally? What meaning might anyone see if they bother to look? And how is your POV's uh, character's understanding of himself change in this moment, even in a small way? Um, and that's just one example of the ways that, that he'll challenge you through the emotional mastery checklist and there's a in the back of the book you have the entire checklist here so it reminds you uh, it allows you to check off the ones that you've uh, mastered um, I want to read you though before I go any further I want to read you a passage in here that I thought really kind of spoke to me just as the writer one thing that I often question is why do I do this um, I think a lot of times, you know, when we sit down to write, you know, I think the first question is, are, you know, are we trying to just stroke our egos? Um, you know, do we want to prove that we can do it? Do we want to prove that to ourselves, to our readers? Uh, at the end of the day, it's entertainment. You know, it's entertainment for us when we re uh, write it. It's entertainment for the reader when they read it. And is that enough? Is that enough of a drive to even get up out of bed and, and bother doing this stuff? And I think, you know, when you first start writing, you know, it's all fun. It's just, it's, it's an exploration of your ideas. And in many ways, it does become an egocentric craft. It's, you know, you want to be authentic, sure. But at the end of the day, you can't help but think that, you know, I just created something that no one else has created. And, you know, it does have a moment of just kind of like, eh, you know, what's going on here today? And, you know, there can be an arrogance in that. And I think um, when we sit back and really evaluate whether or not what we're doing is worth our time and the reader's time, you know, can we get past that feeling, you know, that feeling of pride? Because um, it isn't always about pride. Sometimes it's just about um, communication. Sometimes it's about a lesson. And when I want to read this passage here, I thought this really kind of brought me back to a point of, okay, I see why I do this. And I mean, not that I wouldn't know that, but I, it's not something I'd readily think about. And um, if, if there's no other reason to even read this book, I think this kind of does it. And this is on page 86. It's in the chapter called uh, The Emotional Plot, okay, which is chapter, um, chapter 5. It's from this chapter here. You see the nice graphic there. Um, and here's the passage. Uh, Okay, so being caught up in a story excites scientists to terms like transportation, anticipatory empathy, and counterfactual thinking. Most significant of all is the reason that readers sink into a story at all, disposition theory. 
He says, I'll save you some time. Here's what all that means. First of all, some support for entry. To entertain, a story must present uh, novelty, challenge, and or aesthetic value. A story causes what psychologists call cognitive evaluation in readers, which in plain English means having to think, guess, question, and compare. Making us think as we read not only makes the story intriguing, but medically speaking, it's necessary for our well-being and our mental health. Put simply, to be healthy, we have to experience wonder. It's one of the reasons that reading stories feels necessary. It actually is. Um, and then it goes on to, um, uh, okay, having to think about a story also increases the chances of, of making it a long-term memory and so on. Um, it, it makes the story important. It makes the story not important because I wrote it. It makes the story important because you get something out of it. And this is where I think once you've done this long enough, you forget that that's why you're, you did it in the first place. And so I think, if nothing else, just having the reminder of why we're writing, I think, is very important. It really is to tap into the emotional core of your reader and um, giving your reader a reason not only to come back, but to, to remember, to feel, to feel like it was worth his time, um, to feel like that the characters you've created were worth experience um, an adventure with. Just having craft and by itself is not enough to really make a story worth the time or even the money. Let's be honest, you know, we don't always write free stories. I feel like I do. I feel like, you know, that's ultimately, you know, the stories that get read are the free ones. But, you know, in order to you know, even make a living of storytelling, we want to make sure our readers have something that they want to read. And if we leave out the emotional core of that story, we run a risk of, of that uh, reader not caring. Um, like again, maybe they'll read it just to see what happens, and that's fine. Um, there's nothing wrong with having a story <clears throat> that's ultimately just there to entertain. Um, but how does it entertain? You know, having just to check the, the boxes of craft you may not be good enough for, especially nowadays when we have Netflix and we have uh, Disney Plus and we have all these platforms that, that allow you to binge watch, you know, or allow you to, you know, consume content at tremendous volumes um, that's visual, you know, that that uh, has music. I mean, how what better way to evoke the emotion than music? And, you know, the visual medium definitely capitalizes on that. In the written word, uh, it's harder to do that anymore with the written word. Um, there's a book I just started reading for my job that uh, I'm, I'll probably do something on that in another series down the road. Uh, it's called The, the Shallows, and it um, talks about how the internet has changed our way of thinking, and it's it's kind of you know shortchanged our brains a bit. And I'm not going to get into all that for this this particular video, but. Um, even that got me thinking how even the way we consume uh, content changes the way we think and if we uh, if we f don't trigger the emotion um, in our readers or in even in ourselves uh, there's a good chance that we're going to be disconnected from the characters and the story proper and if we're disconnected you know our readers certainly might be too and it, at that point you wonder like was it worth my time was it worth the reader's time was it worth my time writing it? And so a lot of this, what this uh, book will do too, is help the writer get back into his own emotional core so he can translate that into the page. So um, just a quick overview of some of the chapters that they cover here. Um, just so you know what's in it. Uh, you've got, here's our table of contents, again, with all the nice, fun pictures in here. Uh, it really is a well-illustrated book. Um, you've got your uh, chapter one's the emotional craft of fiction, which is again the title of the book. Uh, inner versus outer, the emotional world. So the emotional world would be like your world building um, and how you uh, get your reader invested in the world you've created. I believe, if I'm not, if my memory is not bad um, enough. Um, You have things like moral stakes in here. Uh, it talks about um, uh, let's see, stirring higher emotions. Do, do, do. 
You have the emotional mastery for small details equal big emotions. Pick a point in your manuscript in which the predominant feeling is large and primary. If you're insured, choose a moment which protagonist feels the greatest fear. Uh, what are small signs that indicate something large is happening? What details, hints, and direct clues or visible effects have you used? Um, and that's all in the emotional world, the emotional scale. So it's really, it's like the, the large picture of emotion. Um, first paragraph, uh, dive from a high platform, walk a country lane, watch your computer freeze, cross the finish line, hear your morning alarm, look for a parking space, toast on your anniversary, it, it keeps on going. We experience life as feelings. It's funny then, so much fiction is written to minimize feelings, or leave them out altogether. Um, it's as if emotions are not a fit subject, or writing about them is too simplistic. Even in fiction that celebrates feelings of romance, for instance, uh, can sometimes work with only limited and familiar emotional palette. Uh, we can wallow in emotional content yet feel curiously empty, but it doesn't have to be that way. Um, so that's like in the emotional world, chapter three. Um, being, hopefully you'll get a sense of what this book is actually trying to accomplish here. It's trying to get you to feel so your readers can feel. Uh, chapter four is emotions, meaning and arc, and then five is emotional plot, which we covered a little bit already. And then I think the best uh, chapters in the entire book are the last two. Um, the emotional, uh, or sorry, the reader's emotional journey, which is like the, by far the longest chapter in the entire book. It's like 50 pages. And then, um, and then you have uh, chapter seven, the writer's emotional journey. So that's these two, the reader and writer. And what this does is this allows you to get a full picture of how to reach out to your reader and by reaching out to yourself first, by knowing yourself, by knowing, um, you know, how to feel so you can convey that feeling. And it goes through a lot of interesting techniques in which to help you do that. And um, I don't want to go through all the details because, again, like everything else, you should just read the book. But I find that it's one of those books where you probably need to really just sit down and think about what it's telling you because there's no craft here. That's really the big um, kind of misconception of the book as a, as a writing tool. Because it's not going to tell you necessarily how to do it. What it's going to do, it's going to talk about, um, it's going to talk about your feelings though. Um, it's going to talk about how to uh, approach your writing and your, your character development and your story development in a way that matters to the reader, not just to the story. Um, how you bring yourself through your experiences, through your memories, um, through the things that kind of give your throat that nice little warm and fuzzy. And actually, I think about even uh, my own stories, I can pinpoint exactly which uh, chapters or which moments in, in a book triggers my, my throat more than any other. And so one example, um, <coughs> excuse me, when you talk too much as you eat drinks. Um, my book, um, The Superhero um, Thriller, which I'm gonna, I still have to split into several parts, but um, in the anthology called Cannonball City, there's a moment where the uh, protagonist, who starts off, he's a sports star, he's a reluctant hero. He gets into himself in a situation where he has to run from the villain, but by running from the villain, he runs into his destiny, and the destiny, of course, is to um, somehow get wrapped up into this league of, of uh, superhumans. Um, it, 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 there's a little of that whole science thing going into it, but it, it's essentially the the story is he becomes a superhero, even though he starts off as you know just a regular sports hero. But he's reluctant; he doesn't want to be in this group. He just you know he, he's really just trying to get home. That's really his whole goal is he just wants to go home and live his life and you know be happy and enjoy his tennis court uh, he's a tennis star and um you know maybe uh let the neighbors play for a small fee whatever you know whatever he can do to kind of get by you know in this his own this new little world he's in while he's you know trying to um stay out of the sights of this uh this hunter that he's looking for him but by uh, trying to avoid this hunter, he, he goes into this realm of, of superheroes. And because he's reluctant, he's trying to do everything he can to 
avoid conflict. And and um, and the thro- thing that gets in my throat is every time I read it is when it's chapter I think thirty one of the anthology. I don't know what it's going to be when I split it all up, but um, the story is you know they just um, this concert got interrupted. Everyone. Um, they're, they have to leave the, the um, Civic Center because uh, the, the singer who happens to be uh, a moonlit, uh, moonlighting superhero, <laughs> she, she's basically telling all the, all the alter egos out in the, in the uh, crowd, look, uh, City Hall is on fire and the mayor's still in there, needs your help. And, uh, and of course, you know, our hero, he, uh, again, he's reluctant, but he feels like he's He's caught in his uniform. Like he, he, there's this story. There's a subplot where he's basically double dating um, his alter egos with one woman and the superheroes with the other. And he's having to keep flipping back and forth during this uh, this double date and and um, well, two timing date really. And uh, he, the the announcement comes while he's still caught in his uniform, and so he's like, he kind of feels the call of duty just because of you know the clothing he's wearing. And he, uh, he goes to City Hall not having a clue on how to deal with this problem because he doesn't really have the proper training yet. His, um, his sidekick training hasn't really fully played out because he's just constantly you know, trying to explore new, uh, new errands, so to speak. And, and he gets to the City Hall and all the, the, um, the current superheroes that he's kind of met throughout his journeys, they're all engaged in this fight on the street and they, none of them can actually get into the building. And so it turns out he's the only one who has no one to fight, so which means he's the one who has to go into the building that's on fire. Again, he's got no training, no experience, but the last line is, uh, it was the place that he'd become one of them. And it just, even as I say it out loud, I kind of get this throat thing, because it's, we spent this entire saga so far getting him to a point where he goes from the reluctant hero to the actual hero. And we can't get there without the emotional journey. We can't get there without wanting to root for him to finally embrace his destiny. And it's in that moment when he's looking at the building, when he realizes he, ha- he doesn't know who to fight. There's no one to fight. The person you're gonna fight is in the building. Go get him. And it's like, you're the only one left. If, if not for you, we're gonna, we're gonna lose. So go, you know, you know what I mean? And so, um, that's, I think, the message in, even in, in the emotional craft of fiction is, you know, you're looking for those moments where you can, you have that emotional moment, that, that, well, not even a moment, like the emotional rail. And uh, Story Genius by Lisa Cron, she calls it the third rail. It's all the same deal where you're, you're looking for that core uh, line or that core connective point that makes your reader want to keep going. And it's not craft, it's not uh, structure that does it, it's the emotion, it's the emotional core. And so that's what this book is about, is about driving, you know, drawing that out and helping you, you know, give yourself some uh, ideas on how to make the most of it. So that's really what it's about, and I do recommend it. It's it's a short book. I mean, it's one of the shortest on my list. I think it's just over 200 pages. Um, it's like, yeah, I mean, it, it literally, I think the, the last chapter ends on page 206. And then you have all the, the checklists and, and indexes and things. So it's not a long book. Now, it, it can be long in that there's a lot to digest. Um, but it's still ultimately um, just a regular, you know, probes read without any charts or anything. that. It's not like the, um, the one we did a few weeks ago on Mastering Plot Twist, where you have some text and some charts and just all this condensed text. It's all very much plain and, and right there for you but it's uh i just i think what it does is it challenges your way of thinking and challenges your approach to writing um and it challenged me again just again asked me you know why do i even do this and um you know i, I admit that when i started reading it I, I felt like it was just another kind of novelty idea but as i got more into it i realized that it, it really brought significance and meaning back to my work uh, just by knowing why I'm doing this, and I, I think if that helps you to, to you know, get you to a point to justify why you do this, I think it's worth it. Um, but certainly to turn that justification into a value for your reader is also a good thing. But check it out. It, again, it's called the Emotional Craft of Fiction. It's not like his other books. Um, I haven't. Um, there's two other books he has that I have not bought yet. And I'm probably going to get them for season three. 
um, but I'm pretty sure they're very much in repeat to the ones we did the last couple of weeks. So that's why I wasn't in a hurry to read and review those, but this one is um, it's a much different uh, place altogether, and I think that's why he wrote it, because he knew it was an important topic to cover that a lot, not a lot of books do cover. Um, but he just, I think the point is he got kind of bored with some of the stories he was reading because they were lacking this fundamental um, element. And by discussing how to bring that element out, I think uh, he kind of vindicated himself um, and the, the, um, the slush pile that, you know, hopefully, you know, new manuscripts will have more emotion in them. Um, and not like melodrama, but like actual connective, you know, um, it'd be like if you, you know, go back to the time, um, he talks about John Grisham's The Painted House, which I actually, I own a copy of it, um, so I haven't read it, but he talks about how it's autobiographical and, and the character, um, you know, he, when he's seven years old, he goes in to get a Tootsie Roll from the local shop. And it's, uh, he, the whole point of that section was talking about how um, too many writers nowadays have too many, um, they, they approach their text uh, and I know I'm guilty of this, uh, with this kind of a cynicism where like all the characters are mean and what Donald Mass is saying is, look, sometimes we can have nice characters. Like you don't want your plot to be fully populated with, no with nothing but nice characters, but you also don't want them to be all jerks either. And it's about, you know, the balance of, of, of you know, your conflicted characters, but also your, your pleasant characters, you know, and, and it's about, um, reminder that you know people are like as human beings you know we have a wide range of, of, of um, personality types and, and character types and all of that and and he brought up this this illustration from the painted house as an example of what it means to have nice characters and again that's an emotional tie it's something that gives your reader um, a memory um, something to appreciate your, your writing um, and, and to want to come back. If, if everything is so cynical that we just are bummed out, why would we want to go back? We don't read to, to, be, to be bummed out. We read, you know, for, um, for thrills, sure, for our empathy, sure, but not to get pissed off. No one, you know, no one wants to just, you know, feel, you know, down when you're done. It's like, you know, that's not a good read. Um, and that's, again, sort of his point is, have enough variation in your text that the reader wants to come back. Um, and that's, again, another example. But um, but no, I think overall it has some good lessons in here. So it's not long. Um, you can read it in a few days. And, you know, I just, I think it's something to check out. So, Emotional Crafted Fiction by Donald Mass. Get it, uh, get it now and tell me what you think. So that's it for today. Um, don't forget to like, subscribe, do all the things that YouTubers tell you to do. And um, if, again, if you want to support my channel, um, buy my books. Uh, Computer Nerd is my thriller. It's a domestic thriller. Uh, if you're into those kinds of stories, you know, check it out. Um, I'm sure I probably could have used a few happier characters. You know, after reading this book, it kind of made me think: Do I have enough happy characters in my in my story? I don't know. Maybe, but it's still uh, an important read. You know, it goes back to that. You know, page 86 mantra, it's like, you know, you can write to inspire, but also write to teach. Uh, the write to matter, and, and I think it's one of those books where I think the, the um, social part of it is pretty important. Um, but other than that, you know, I have uh, Gutter Child is my other popular one uh, that's more comedic. And, you know, if you like funnier stories, check that one out. It's shorter, too. It's a novella. Um, but yeah, um, if you want to support this channel, that's the best way to do it. Um, and uh, my website, jeremybercy.com, hopefully is online by now. Um, if not, it should be soon. Um, just bookmark it. One day it'll be open. Um, and then if it's open, subscribe to my newsletter so you can get new information on new books that come out. So these are all the ways you can support the channel and support me too. Um, and then check the link below for uh, how to find this book and, and all that. So anyway, um, let me know what you think of the book if you read it. And, uh, and uh, don't forget to, if you're a writer who has a book that um, has a craft book that you want reviewed, uh, you can let me know. Just send me a message uh, through email. Um, my slate's pretty full for 
probably the next couple of seasons, so it'll be a long time before I get to it. But um, I still like to know what y'all are interested in. So just keep me uh, posted on that. But anyway, that's it for today. Thanks for watching, and uh, come back next week. We're going to do another unconventional book. Uh, that's still one that I think is worth uh, going over. So do you come back next week for that. See you then. So thanks for watching. Bye.